So tell me, okay, I'm so excited because you know, this is November 2nd, right? Scary. Yeah. I know. And this, what's scarier is I'm going to be 50 years old I on November 27th. I don't even remotely feel sorry for you and you. Look <laughs> I know, but it's just, you know, it's, it's just logical for a woman. I mean, I don't know. I've never been a big, it's never been gorgeous. a big deal to me at all. You look 20 years younger. I guess it's, not, it's like not so much that, and I appreciate the compliment, but it's more like, um, gosh, like 50, like I could go to Ross, dress for less, and get a senior citizen discount now. It, I can't relate to it. I know, I know, I know. You know, I always thought in our culture, we should honor age so that when we get there, we're excited. Like we can't wait. But we have a culture that does the exact opposite. It, it's built in to disempower us. It's the right. culture, it, it's, you can't avoid it because it deifies and it honors the youth. And the youth is so temporary. I was looking at this thing today. I, I always like looking at um, these pictures, like what people look like when they were younger, movie stars and actors. And, and they had this thing about people who were married for a long period of time. They showed when they were married and they showed now. And I was looking at all these beautiful people who were in their 20s and 30s. And now they just look, 30 years later, they look like just regular old people. Right. There's nothing beautiful about them. I mean, they're beautiful probably, but it doesn't have that same kind of thing that we admire so much. And it's like the culture makes it scary to get old and everybody's going to get old. Right. How stupid is that? It is what if we had rearranged it? So 50 was like, yay, 50, 60. Yay. I'm going to get a social security card. I'm going to, I'm going to be able to get a discount. I'm going to be honored by my, my, by youngsters. They're going to ask me questions and they're going to take care of me. And wouldn't that be awesome? It would be. And I think it was a culture at once. I think it, it was part and of some places it is still, you know, yeah. we're such a silly, immature society and culture that, you know, you get 10 years, they gave you 10 years or 20 years, maybe. So yeah. from your 20 to 40, and then even if you're in your 40, basically, and then in your 40s, you can look sort of good, kind of, if you if you defeat father time. Uh -huh. And then you, by the time you're in your mid-50s, you're just a regular person. No matter <laughs> how beautiful you were, you're a regular person at 55. You know, right. even a handsome regular person, or a beautiful regular person, it doesn't have the same cachet. And it's, it's just a, such a silly way to run a society. And it to is. Run a culture. It's do you think it was, do you think it was purposefully set up that way? Or do you think- well, you know, there's conspiracy dangerous. theories, and it could be set that way to, mm -hmm. to get people out of the gene pool. And to only honor people who could procreate. And that's kind of an evolutionary thing. You know, from an evolutionary standpoint, I hate to say it, when we can't make babies anymore, nature doesn't care about us. Because we're really here for, well, you know, we gotta be, you guys got to be, facts are the facts. We're really here to procreate. I mean, that's why animals and living beings are alive from a nature perspective. Nature, yeah. From a nature perspective, we're here to procreate. Mm -hmm. And so once you can no longer procreate, it becomes, to nature anyway, you become irrelevant. And so what you want to do is you want to construct society intelligently. Mm -hmm. So you don't just go by what your natural instincts are. And instead of just throwing out old people because they can't procreate, you honor old people because they have wisdom. Yeah. Look how much, you know, the thing is, I don't look at anywhere near like I looked like when I was 30 and young and studly, but I'm a hell of a lot smarter. <laughs> I know I had a, I can hit a curveball now. There's, there aren't a lot of curveballs that can take, you know, that I'm going to swing and miss at. Although, uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. can you know you can predict things better. You can you know how to adjust better. You know how to live right. your life more effectively. So I know I always I always felt like you know I, I I used to say to my mom as well when I when I get to forty that's when things are going. I I just feel like that's when I'm going to be at my prime. And then yeah. I came and I really did feel like that's when I looked my best and I felt my best and I felt like, good. And then all of a sudden it's like I'm fifty. Like it just happened like that. You know, it's crazy. Fifty six. When I get, when I turn, you know, I don't know if you know about astrology, but fifty six is your second Saturn return. Oh you my gosh! Yes, I know all about it. Yes, it's your second Saturn return, and I'm telling you, I know my when I'm fifty nine now. So when I was fifty six, all of a sudden I started to think about mortality, about aging, about my body. I never, I never crossed my mind. I started reading books on aging. I would listen to videotapes on graceful aging. Uh -huh. It's like, it hit me that, you know, I'm in the second half of my life. And basically, you know, I, I look at it, you get four quarters. Zero to 20 is one quarter. 20 to 40 is another. 40 to 60 is another. And then 60 to 80 is fourth quarter. And then if you're lucky, you get overtime. <laughs> but, but Catalina Martone, it's uh -huh. sudden death overtime. <laughs> So you might get, you get overtime if you're lucky and you took care of yourself, but it's sudden death. That you don't, is right? amazing. That so is you're in this, you're not even in the third quarter yet. You're oh my still, gosh. Well, that's you're not even in the third quarter. I'm starting the, uh, you're not even in the fourth quarter. You're halfway through the third quarter. I'm in, I'm starting my fourth quarter. Oh, I'm and, sweating. And <laughs> I know, you know, but here's the thing. That's where being spiritual comes in. 
Yes. That's where understanding that our physical body and the physical reality we live in is not primal. It's not fundamental. Mm -hmm. It's an epi phenomenon. It comes out of spirituality. Spirituality is the core and you never age spiritually. And what makes us so weird about getting old is inside spiritually, you're the same age. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, you're eternal and immortal and universal and infinite and you don't age. And then you look in the mirror from that perspective and you say, who the hell is that? I am 19. I don't know who that is in the mirror because I'm 19. Right. Who is that little guy in the mirror? I don't know what he's doing there, but I'm 19 and I don't want him there anymore. I mean, that's kind of how we think. Yeah. Because early inside, and that's really where you want to be. And my mom's 87 and she still wow. says inside, I'm 19. You wow. know? And, and if you look at old paintings of the old masters, when they show people, they always show people with angel, they always show angels as babies. And when they die, the angel's coming out and the angel's always a baby. Uh -huh. like that's how you got to look at it. you got to be grounded in your spirituality i believe this is my take on it. no i think that's beautiful you're blowing my mind right now i mean we all you and i have never really talked at this depth before it's always like nature and science and whatnot hang on let me kill my dog real quick come here she found she found the squeaky toy but um i think it's i think it's really poignant you know um did you leave me Okay. I think it's uh, what you said about, you know, being eternally the same age. And I think that's beautiful. And I do feel like I have become more spiritual, even though I wanted to be a more spiritual, spiritually minded and oriented when I was younger, you really just get sidetracked by everything. And then when I feel like I started to really question my mortality in the, in the last probably like four or five years, because I had some health stuff happen. And I thought, mm. oh my God, I'm actually, I never thought of myself as someone who, when they, when you hear statistics about, you know, who, who dies, you know, in their fifties and, you know, like a uh, heart disease and who's more prone to this and that. I never put meaningful. myself. It was never really meaningful to you. Never. And then all of a sudden, you know, I had to have, I had this whole anemia issue and I had, um, I had to have a blood transfusion and my heart had a tear in it because I was anemic for so Are long. You serious? And all of a sudden, you know, this cardiologist is telling me this and I'm thinking, I am all of a sudden a statistic. Like I could easily be wow. one of those young women who are young women, you know, getting up there, 50s, whatever, 40s who dies of heart disease or whatever. Uh, and I had like a come to Jesus literally moment and during that time. So yeah, I agree with that. It takes that. It takes that. Yeah. Well, you know, I read about people now, they're 66, they die. They're 65, they die. They're 68, they die. And I'm thinking I could die at 68 and you know, it'd be normal, relatively a little young, but relatively normal. That gives me eight years. Ah, uh, you know, eight and a half years. How I, I, what is that eight and a half years, you know? Nothing. So it really, it really behooves us, I believe, it reminds us when you, I think it's important to keep that in mind, yeah. to keep our mortality in mind, and then road rage doesn't bother you, and right. you know, you tear something, it doesn't bother you, or you drop, spill the milk, it doesn't bother you, you know, if you always keep this in mind, how short everything is in our mortality, and for some reason, the human mind doesn't go there, it doesn't even want to go there, try bringing it up to somebody sometime, right. nobody wants to hear it. You know, but it's really important to live your life that way because then you value everything. You value every moment. You value the sunshine. I mean, it's not very long before I'm, you know, even if I live to 90, whatever, 30 years, 90, I'll be laying in bed with morphine, a morphine drip. You know, I won't be able to appreciate anything. And, you know, at, at that point, in life, if you can put yourself to that point in life, it, just talking to you becomes a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. Just waking up in the morning becomes a beautiful experience. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, Right. And all the wonderful things we have, if you pay attention to it, but if that, it's important to use that as a reminder to pay attention to all of the beautiful things we have in our life. The right. sunny days, the rainy days, your kids, your husband, your wife, you know, your spouses, your friends, talking, yeah. being so, a body. Yeah. So, so do you feel like as far as your, uh, you said it, at 56, you started to kind of pay more attention to your mortality and whatnot, but you look like you do not look your age. Absolutely not. Like easily, you and I could probably be the same age. Like if someone looked, you know, when they see this video, they go, they look the same age. Or you I just have really black hair. Right. But, really black hair. but your yeah. face though, I mean, you do not look your yeah, age. It's because I, you know, I try to, I actually, you know, I do, I live right and everything, but you know, don't be, it's, it's important. I was a very handsome guy. You're a very beautiful woman. It's important for people who are beautiful and handsome not to count on that, not to rely on that aspect right. of our beauty. And it's so easy for beautiful women who go to the front of the line wherever they go, you know, wherever you go, you're, and I know you can relate to this, wherever you go, you're in the front of the line. You wait, get, wait, wait, what line is this? Just kidding. Whatever. 
I don't remember. remember. When, you're at the club, when you're at the club, you know, you're the one that gets in. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like there's advantages that are built into being physically attractive. And then you reach a certain point in your life where you're not physically attracted. And my job as a skincare professional is I work with women like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a very bittersweet time. It, it's bittersweet in the sense that they don't have anymore. They feel like they're not getting the advantages anymore. But it's sweet because they're wiser. They're more intelligent. Right. They're more able to handle life. I mean, think about it. Would you go back to being 20 years old when you couldn't? Think of all the... Oh, no way. Angst. I was a mess. I was right? a mess. All the angst you had. Yeah, you were young. You were beautiful. And you're you, know, you had all the things going for you that youth brings. But mentally and emotionally and, and your ability to handle life was nowhere near as you were nowhere near with that. So what about, what about this? This is switching gears just a tiny bit. So um, I had this incredible conversation with a group of older women once who were in their late fifties and early sixties. And they, we were all talking about hormone replacement therapy. And they said that one of uh, their, the oldest woman, she decided to go on the pellet and they all went out to dinner one night and they were sitting in just them having a girl's night and these guys sent over all the champagne. And so they're all hanging out, drinking, thanks for the champagne. They couldn't believe it because they hadn't had someone do that before in ages. So cut to the end of the evening, the guys come over to say hello and they, they're saying thank you for the champagne. And they basically had hit on, they were hitting on the champagne was for the older woman who had just gotten the pellet. They were all convinced that some kind of pheromone shift had happened that created this awareness for these men to sense her. Could easily have done that. That's really? Oh my God, tell me more. Well, what is, what's the word you just said? Say it again. Pheromone? Say it slowly. Pheromone. Amone. A hormone. A pheromone is a hormone that you can smell, that you can sense. Estrogen is a fertility hormone. It's a youth hormone. It's a hormone of, of it has to be a baby-making hormone. That's its main role, is to make babies. Well, I don't say main role. One of its main roles is to make babies. It says you're fertile. Mm -hmm. Blonde hair is a sign of estrogen. So, you know, how little girls will have blonde hair and then they get older, they don't have blonde hair anymore. Blonde, blonde. you're saying blonde, not blonde. long. Yes, yeah. So we want, we, men are geared to sense estrogen. So it could very well, it could easily have been that. Wow. Uh, estrogen could easily have pheromone. It, it, the estrogen itself could, be, could have been pheromonal or the estrogen could have turned on other chemicals that are pheromones in the body. So yes, absolutely, you can do that. That's estrogen. so fascinating because but I- you're, do you're sending signals that I'm, I'm fertile. Right. What's the point of that? What's the point of sending signals to somebody that you're fertile so you can get some attention? Maybe. That's I mean, if, what it is. Because if, if you're you used attention. to that as a woman, if you're used to that as a woman, even if it's subconscious, you know? Think about what is the, if you're, if you're getting juice out of getting attention, dig deeper. Let's dig deeper into that. What does that mean that you're getting, you're getting satisfaction out of getting male attention? What is the, what's the end game for that? That I'm, that I'm fertile, I mean, but I'm not, that I'm youthful, but I'm not youthful, that I'm young, but I'm not young. So right. what's the end game? What, what, are, what are you trying to do? Just to fake yourself out, to pretend you're a certain way that you're not. I mean, I think ultimately to feel loved would be somebody's ultimate purpose. Right? That's exactly right. But did that guy love her? No, of course not. So did she really feel loved? Right. You know, it's fake. you know what I'm saying? So yeah, it is. Now, if she went out and uh, helped somebody or loved somebody or took care of her husband or her kids or her mother or something like that and got real love, then that would be love. So is it a lack of love that we're doing that we're on hormone replacement therapy because we have a lack of love? <laughs> is that what it is? I mean, it could very well be. We don't feel loved. We don't feel self-love, maybe. Mm. You know, if, maybe it's a lack of self-love. To that, me, yeah. the, right? Now, you know, there was a guy named Matthew, uh, Maxwell Maltz who wrote a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. Did you ever hear this? No, I'll write it down. In the 50s. It's a classic book. It's okay. called Psycho-Cybernetics. It's about how the mind works like a computer. And what he noticed, he's a plastic surgeon. And he wrote the book because he noticed after he would do plastic surgery on people, when they took the bandages off their face, they would think he didn't do anything. They would be like, you didn't do anything to me. He said, yeah, I changed your nose. I changed your chin. I changed your eyes. I did everything. No, you didn't do anything because in their head, they didn't see it. Mm. And he realized that how we look and, and our, our sense of how we look and how the environment responds to us is not based on the shape of our face. It's based on what's inside. It's based on how we feel. So the, do you ever see an older guy with a beautiful younger woman? And you ask, you ask the beautiful young woman, she says, yeah, he's got this great energy. He's got this great charisma. He's so, ha he's so happy. He's so funny. He's so smart. And so that's what's attractive to you. That's really what's attractive. I mean, think about it to yourself. I mean, what's attractive to you in a person, the shape of their face or how their charisma, their energy? Wouldn't you, I, I don't know, I've never met your husband, but if he looked differently, but he had the same kind of qualities, he would be just as attractive to you because you're attracted to his qualities. We're attracted to who people are. 
Well, and we, it's interesting you say that too, because right now we have some friends that don't, that we don't see often and they're visiting us right now and they haven't seen him in a while and they can't believe how much, how, how much he's changed. And I'm like, I haven't noticed it at all. Like I've not noticed it. Because you're attracted. You fought, fell, fell in love with him, with who he is mm -hmm. as a person. The shape of his face isn't a factor when he has this wonderful energy. And so we have to learn to be, we are energy beings, but we're not consciously energy beings. We sense energy, but we're not aware that we sense energy consciously. I'm speaking in generalization. Some people do, obviously. But generally speaking, people don't have this sensation of their energy sense, their energy self, mm -hmm. their energy being. It's the energy being that we fall in love with with somebody. Right. My girlfriend is so freaking adorable and cute as a tweet, <laughs> as a person. She's like this angel as a person. And, she, and I find her to be incredibly physically beautiful, but it's who she is mm -hmm. that is the most impossible for me not to love who she is as a being and and i have to be very in touch with my energy self and with the energy world and that's really what this is to me when I, i'm in the skincare business which is about as superficial and cosmetic as you could get potentially but what i'm trying to do with the skincare world is i'm trying to change it into a health into a health phenomenon i'm trying to say to people when we look at each other we're not looking at the color we're not looking at the beauty of their skin we're looking at the health of their skin Mm -hmm. What makes somebody radiant, what makes somebody beautiful, what makes somebody attractive is a sense of health, a sense that they're whole, a sense that they're not sick, a sense that they're not somehow compromised, a sense that they're fully fleshed and, and, and vibrant, that there's a sense of vibrancy. And that's why my skincare products work the way they do, because they change the vibrancy of the skin. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the, and by the way, your skin looks freaking amazing. Thank you. I mean, you must know. And, well, and, there's this product called Truth Treatments. And right. It looks healthy. It looks glowing healthy. So like you um, shifted for, because you started out with like Carmex or something like that. I started with Blistex. Blistex. So you were Yeah, doing but I was always radical. I was always a radical pharmacist. I see I that. Always, I was always kind of, um, I got into pharmacy because I took a course. I have a journalism degree. And, wow. and in journal, and when I was in, I went to college when I was 16. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. So. I studied, I studied journalism because I like to write and I like to talk and I thought journalism would be a good thing. And then when I was taking journalism, when I was uh, taking my journalism curricula, I took a course called psychopharmacology, which was about the mind, was about the chem, uh, the pharmacology of mind drugs of, of uh, psycho, psychotropic drugs and right, not just uh, not just pres you know prescription ones, antipsychotics and such, and also mushrooms and LSD and all that kind of stuff. It was the seventies and I was kind of ah okay I see. <laughs> so I was blown away by this idea that you can manipulate the body with chemistry and that the body was a chemical, chemical entity. And one of the courses, I, one of the subject matters in psychopharmacology was, was a course on perception. And I, for the first time, I realized that what we see is not what's out there. The brain and the, the we, we only see light and then the eyes rearrange it and the brain rearranges it. And what we end up seeing is based on our memories and based on our experiences and it's a reconstruction. Mm -hmm. We don't see the world, we reconstruct it and then we portray it to ourselves as we reconstruct it. And it totally blew me away. So I, went, I decided, and I don't know why I did this, but I heard pharmacists made a lot of money. And so I figured I would, I would go to pharmacy school. And I'm in pharmacy school, I'm, I'm studying this stuff about how we're poisoning people. In pharmacy school, you study poison. And it, was, it just kind of blew me away that, you're, that we're studying about how poison, how, how we poison the body when we're sick to make it better. It, just, <laughs> it was like, I, I couldn't, it didn't compute to me. And so... I, the more I studied, uh, so I was studying drugs as poison. Then I started, one of the things we study in pharmacy school is nutrition. And so we study nutrition, not like, doc, not like a dietitians or nutritionists. We study like the medicinal value of vitamin A, how night blindness is, is, is cured by vitamin A, how arthritis is cured by essential fatty acids, how heart disease is cured by magnesium. And so I'm learning, I'm learning about drugs and poisons, and I'm learning about nutrition and curing, and I'm, I'm thinking, what the hell? Why are we doing the poisons? We should be doing the nutrients. And then at the same time, I'm a bodybuilder. I'm just lifting weights as a bodybuilder. And I knew there were certain things I had to do to grow my body. I had to take protein. I had to do vitamins. I had to do creatine. I had to do all my nutrients. I had to eat right. And so it just put one and one together. And I'm like, oh, gosh, maybe we should be focusing on nutrition. And then I worked for Blistex. And in the Blistex lab, I was learning how you can manipulate tissue, skin tissue, with topicals. And then I just kind of put it all together and I created this concept of taking care of your skin using nutrition and taking care of your body using supplements. And then I had a major, I was always spiritual. I had a really bad childhood. When you have a bad childhood, you learn to see energy. 
that's one. I don't know if you have what your childhood was like, but you ask I, Andy, was, I had a good childhood, but I was really sick and I had crazy yeah. stuff like that as a kid where I could see things and I'd have out of bodies and all this. You stuff. learn to see the other world, the energy world, when you're traumatized in some level. Now, you weren't traumatized, but you had some trauma. And so when the, it forces you, it compels you to look outside of the physical world because the physical world is so traumatic. And I use spirituality as a defense mechanism. I learned to read people. I learned to see when somebody was suffering. I learned that only people who were in pain would hurt you. So I learned to see people when they were in pain Wow! as a protective mechanism because I knew if they were in pain, I was in trouble. So I learned to make, not only did I learn to see when people were in pain, but I learned how to make their pain go away psychically because I knew, because I knew that if I could make their pain go away, even temporarily, I would be safe. So I learned all of these skills from my traumatic childhood and I learned all about nutrition from my pharmacy school and I put it all together and I started to realize that there's ways that we could be, there's ways that we can manipulate our body that nobody's teaching us about. Nobody's teaching us about nutrition. Nobody's teaching us about uh, the spiritual side of things. We're using drugs and we're using doctors and we're using all these physical modalities and we're sicker than ever before. And so little by little, I started to develop a specialty in using spiritual tech. And I, I work, consider myself an energy worker and a spiritual worker as much as I'm a skincare person. And, and also a nutritionist, I just kind of put it all together. And 60 years later or, or 40 years later, here I am. Nice. Well, I think that was at one time um, used to be the, the common doctor, like the shaman, you know, used to be somebody who knew how to view a human being from all those Absolutely. aspects of what they were, not just energetic and spiritual, yeah. but physical. All of it. Yeah. And so spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, all of it. Well, what is the word, you know, the word health comes from the word whole whole healthy is health holy they're often the same root h-a-l health holy whole to be whole is to be healthy it's to be holy when you're whole when you're integrated it's about integration and even in philosophy now there's a new philosophy called integral philosophy have you heard of this no. integral philosophy and in philosophy there's these movements there were the transcendentalists and there were the romanticists I don't know if you follow any of this stuff, but in the history of philosophy, you have all these philosophical movements. So the most recent move, the most recent three movements were modernism, which is about black and white. The modernist period was about right and wrong, this way, that way, uh, uh, straight edges, tall buildings in, in architecture, uh, 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 the good guys and the bad guys, right or wrong, period, right or wrong. And then it came postmodernism, mm -hmm. and postmodernism is where anything could be true. There isn't just one way; anything can be true. Today, what's that? that was the 60s. Right. You know, the 50s and 60s. It started with Dadaism in the 20s. and It was this idea that you could do anything you want to do, which is kind of powerful, and I sort of like it. But even better now, it's not that anything is true. Integral philosophy is the new one, and it says everything is true. Not that anything can be true, but it's all true. There's no, there's no one way to do things because everything has its benefits, and that's called integral philosophy. That's when you integrate everything. So yes. this is us just creating labels for something that's already in existence. Yes. It's that those things have changed and become yes. different. Quantum. Right. Exactly. Quantum yes. physics brought this idea of superposition. Have you ever heard of this? Uh -huh. So everything is in superposition. Everything is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And we actually have quantum computers now. Do you know about quantum computers? I do. I love me some quantum physics and quantum I, I do too. I do too. So quantum computers are so cool because everything's in superposition so they can work really, really fast because everything's possible. So integral philosophy is reflected in superposition in quantum physics, which is now reaching the mainstream in the sense of quantum computing. Now we're still probably 20 years away or 30 years away from quantum computing, but I was just reading that Google has a prototype of quantum computer now. So really? quantum computers can create, can do trillions of calculations a second because everything is in superposition. Right now, everything is zero one. So it's not superposition yet. Mm -hmm. But now, when everything's in superposition, everything is possible because everything's infinite. Instead of having binary digits, zero and one, you have an infinite amount of digits. And that creates computing speeds that are incomprehensible. The body is thought to be a quantum computer and cells are thought to be quantum computers. They can calculate, do calculations instantly. So is this, do you feel like this ties in with AI and like singularity Absolutely. at some it's, point? It's part of it. We're, we're very close to the singularity. The singularity, technically speaking, is when the curve goes straight up. Right now, time and technology are at a, they're going like this. So as time progresses, technology progresses like this. But as we get more and more technologically advanced, instead of a straight line, it goes like this, where advances in technology happen really, really fast. So what took, what took maybe, 10 years or 20 years or 30 years is now taking a shorter and shorter period of time until it reaches a point where time and technology are instantaneous, where we create technological advances 
instantaneously. Now we'll never approach that obviously, but we are, and that's the singularity, but we're getting very, very, very close. And you can look in two years, the technology is happening. Technology is changing so freaking fast. Excellent. You and I, yeah. we remember pre iPhone days. That was a mere 10 years ago. Do you realize that? That you know, was there was no Dropbox, there was no Airbnb, there was no Uber, there was no cloud, there was no iPhone, there, look, there was no YouTube. Look at all the things that happened in 10 years. Wow. 10 years. Okay, I, don't, I mean, is this amazing? It's amazing. Look, look at the conversation you and I are having. 10 years ago, this wasn't, this wasn't possible 10 years ago. Right. I mean, I'm, so, I'm like right there. Does it scare you at all? No, I'm so excited. I'm so, I, I wish I could be here longer so I could see it. I mean, well, maybe you'll be able to. Maybe they maybe, can cry, maybe cry. I'll be uploaded onto a disc. Somewhere. Yeah, they'll cryogenically suspend your brain and then they'll upload it into a little I'll iPhone. It, and right. then I'll be like, Ben, welcome. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. That creeps me out a little bit. Well, um, there's an old saying about a scientist who decides he's going to find out the meaning of life and he goes up and climbs a mountain, the highest mountain nobody's ever climbed before. And he climbs up it and he says, I'm going to be the first guy on this mountain. He gets up there. And he finally gets to the top of the mountain that nobody's ever been on before and he sees him old master meditating on the top of the mountain. And it's like science, science tries to get to where spirituality has right. always been. But we have telepathy machines, but we'd have telepathy anyway. You know? Right. Yeah, we've had all, it all along. All along. You walk into a room as a woman, you walk into a crowded a room with a bunch of guys, you are getting all kinds of telepathic sing signals right away. Stay away from this guy. Talk to that guy. That guy's cute. I'm, I'm going to marry that guy. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> this guy is, is some bad news, all of that. I mean, right? It's, well, that's so interesting because I think that um, what you were saying before about we construct our reality, right? Um, like your relationship with money, the, the way you view money, your relationship with how you view the opposite sex, with how you view politics, with how you view everything, your physical, the way you look, like you construct that. And how many of us have different, I mean, all of us have like these different levels of dysmorphia where we, like you said, the wrappers come off, the bandages come off yeah. the face and they don't see anything different. Absolutely. Like, like an anorexic person, you know, they're literally starving to death and they look at themselves in the mirror and they see Dysmor that. That's the most amazing thing to me, body dysmorphic uh, syndrome, where you look in the mirror and you don't see how skinny you are because you're reconstructing it on your beliefs. But we all do it subtly when we worry about our bank account, but we have a great family life and we got a great home and it's really warm and, you know, you got wonderful kids, you got food on the table and, you know, you got plenty of clothes, but you're worried about your bank account and right. you can't, and you can't think about anything else, and you completely don't even see your house anymore. You don't even see your husband anymore. You don't even see your kids, you don't even see your dog, you don't even see your, your health, you don't see anything because you're only focusing on your bank account. So we have such a, a tremendous ability to synthesize our reality as we want to, as we like to, as we see fit. And once we nail that down, once we really understand that, we could be potentially anyway in bliss whenever we want. Mm. We can snap a finger and be in bliss. This is such a beautiful conversation because it, 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 it's going to transition me here to change gears about this um, whole concept of the endocannabinoid system. So I'm super curious about like there must be a system that integrate in our bodies that integrates what we're talking about, which is like, you know, using spiritual spirituality, whether it's meditation or prayer or whatever it is to try and connect being present and being in the moment to be able to visualize to be able to do telepathy to able to sense sense messages being sent from other people there has to be a biochemical way to reboot that system in us do you know what i mean like absolutely there's two ways and the beautiful thing is it goes from two directions if you right now sense spiritual sense god say sense some kind of spiritual spiritual aspect to life right now just while you're talking to me even or you just sit still and do it your endocannabinoid uh, endocannabinoid uh, uh, chemicals will go up if you smoke pot or you take in endocannabinoids, you'll start to become more spiritual. So it goes both ways. So you can rev up your endocannabinoid system through your mind, or you can change your mind through uh, putting endocannabinoids in your system. That's what's beautiful about the endocannabinoid system. And that's why CBD is not a fad. That's why CBD is not something that's gonna be come here, you know, be, be around today and then something they, they laugh about in 10 years. Mm -hmm. In 100 years, they're gonna be talking about, they're gonna be using CBD like we use aspirin today. Because the endocannabinoids that we get externally are the same as the, or, sorry, the cannabinoids that we get externally are the same as the endocannabinoids that we make inside our body. And this isn't a new idea. I learned about this in pharmacy school in the 80s. In the 1980s, we learned about the endocannabinoid system. 
The endocannabinoid system is a, 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 a part of the nervous system that runs on molecules that are found in plants. And this is an amazing idea. Plants make molecules that are found inside the body. It's not just marijuana or hemp, by the way. Pretty much all plants make some version of endocannabinoids, some, some more than others. Uh, so you can ingest cannabinoids. I, I don't want to say, I keep saying endocannabinoids. Endo means inside. Mm -hmm. so endocannabinoids are cannabinoids that you make inside your body. Plants make cannabinoids that are similar to the endocannabinoids. They're phytocannabinoids. Phyto means plants. So phytocannabinoids mimic or are, or are uh, uh, analogous to endocannabinoids. So you can change your endocannabinoid system by ingesting phytocannabinoids. This is one of the reasons why spices are so good. You know, what we call spices are really medicines that contain not just phytocannabinoids, but phytochemicals, phyto meaning plants. Phytochemicals like phytocannabinoids interact with your nervous system, interact with your hormone system. So you take in phytocannabinoids from hops or from oregano or from sage or from marijuana or from hemp. You take in these phytocannabinoids, they get into your bloodstream, and they interact with your cells the way your endocannabinoids do. So the same responses that you get from the endocannabinoid system, which are relaxing responses, the endocannabinoid system has a general relaxing uh, um, property, mm -hmm. you get when you take in clove and, and oregano and marijuana and hemp. And that's an amazing thing, that you can change your neurology by ingesting plants or by smoking plants, by somehow putting plant chemicals into your body. You could change your neurochemistry. And the endocannabinoid system is no mere neurochem no mere component of the neurochem uh, neurochemical part of the body. It's a fundamental part. In fact, you have more neurochemical, nor more uh, cannabinoid receptors on cells than any other type of receptor. It's probably the oldest and the most fundamental aspect of the neurohormonal system in the body, and that's really massive. That means wow. you can change you can change your body fundamentally with, neuro, with, uh, phyto, uh, with cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids. And that's why I don't know if you ever smoke too much pot, but it is not a good feeling. It's not, have you ever smoked too much pot? It's yeah, a, well, so that, so that, okay. So. You change everything in your body. You yeah. change everything, it feels terrible. And people who have smoked too much pot or ingested too much THC from now that, now that you can eat it, they don't want to do it again. Right. <laughs> because it's not a good feeling because you ch massively change your biochemistry to the point where you feel absolutely awful. So the trick is to know where to do it, to know how to do it. But the fact is, is that it's, you're not doing anything external to your body because it's built into the, your own neurochemistry. I mean, I have so many questions about this. So, okay, as far as, let's, let's start, work our way backwards with the uh, smoking too much pot. So some people, so is, it, is the THC fundamental to having the, uh, the properties of CBD work or? THC is one of the cannabinoids, tetrahydrocannabinoid or tetrahydrocannabinol. It's one THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. It just happens to be the psychoactive. It's a very, very psychoactive component, extremely psychoactive. Now, back in the old days, if you got pot, you get maybe 5%, 3% THC in the pot. But through genetic modification, uh, breeders and plant uh, people who grow cultivators, people who grow marijuana, they've, they've done their breeding techniques and all the stuff that they do, the cloning and all the, the, the leaf cuttings. And they end up with it. Now you have strains that have 50% THC or 40% THC, 30% THC, 10, 15, 20 times the THC that used to be in, in pot. So now if you smoke pot, and I haven't smoked pot in many years, but now if you, people who smoke pot, it's incredibly intense because of the high THC content. But the stuff that does the work on pain relief doesn't necessarily uh, have psychoactive properties. So you can get pain relief from marijuana, uh, from uh, cannabinoids without having the psychoactive properties. Not everybody wants to be stoned. You know, being stoned might be good if you're just sitting around relaxing, but you want to go through your day stoned. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, there are, because there's hundreds of cannabinoids, they figured out which one of these cannabinoids are, have anti-inflammatory properties, which ones have analgesia properties, which ones have muscle relaxing properties, which ones have anti-anxiety and sleep-inducing properties. And they've managed to figure out which ones, which cannabinoids do one. And they, they've created plants that have more of different types of CBDs and CBGs and CBAs, and these are all the various cannabinoids. So they're basically creating plants now that have more, uh, have, uh, have, where the specific cannabinoids that do specific functions are, uh, are present in increased amounts. Okay. So, 
So now you can isolate specific, now they have broad spectrum CBD, uh, uh, broad spectrum products that have various CBDs in them or isolates that have one, one specific cannabinoid in them. I should say various cannabinoids, not various CBD, but various cannabinoids or isolated cannabinoids. So what about, um, what else uses cannabinoid receptors? Like we know that- melatonin- Higher body, every single system. No, but I, I mean like actually the receptor site, like can f- psychoactive, psychotropic drugs can- Oh uh, no, no. Cannabinoids are specific for cannabinoids. LSD or uh, mescaline or they don't interact with the cannabinoid receptor. Or, or benzos or- Benzos don't interact with the cannabinoid receptor. They don't there compete may, for any- I should okay. say, it's possible that there could be some interaction, but molecular speaking, it's unlikely. Benzodiazepines, cannabinoids are a very, very complex mo- molecule. There's no real drugs that interact with the cannabinoid receptor that I know of. It's possible they may find them, but no, the cannabinoid receptors are pretty much for cannabinoids. I guess I'm curious because I wonder why so many people have so many different reactions. Like some people, for like me, for example, I... I cannot smoke pot. I cannot do edibles. I like, and if I, when I have experimented with trying to do the tiniest micro dosing of it in order to, uh, but it's too scary because it, you don't know, right? You don't it may know. Maybe affecting a part of your brain more than it affects others. You may have a sense more, you, it's the part of your brain that controls anxiety, maybe more receptive, more responsive to cannabinoids than to other people. Uh, well, I wonder because of all, you know, like I definitely used to take certain like benzos and things when I used to have panic attacks. And I wondered if people that have, you know, that are on those type of drugs that it competes or something like that. But you're saying it probably does. No, no there's no real interact. I don't think there's competitive. There, that's a, what you're talking about is called an antagonistic reaction where one molecule will either block another molecule or one molecule will either will suppress or will support another molecule. That's called an agonistic reaction. There's antagonistic reactions and there's agonistic reactions. An agonist is something that supports or adds to a response. An antagonist blocks a response. Okay. So there may be some agonistic re- agonistic responses to benzodiazepines, but I don't really I don't I don't know of any. I think they're completely separate molecules and receptors. Okay. And then um, I knew uh, I had a client whose daughter this happened to, but I also read something in like it was Time Magazine, like maybe six years ago, about. Um, the potential, very rare potential, but indeed it has happened where people have smoked uh, marijuana, THC, full-blown marijuana, and then got triggered into having psychosis. Psychotic and, yeah. psychotic. Well, I don't think that's a, I don't think, well, yeah, I don't know necessarily that that's a neurological response as much as it's a psychological response. In other words, you get a neurological effect and that triggers a psychological episode based on emotions or based on history or based on memory. If, you're, if you never had any trauma in your life and you never had any psychotic episodes and you were a completely normal person, that's unlikely. But what, if about, you had, what about a, a history in the family of schizophrenia? Yeah, you had, I don't know about the family necessarily, but if you, had a pre, if you have a predisposition to that, the changes in the cannabinoid system can trigger a psychotic break. Absolutely. That can happen with any drug. But it's not going to happen to somebody who isn't who, who doesn't have a history that way, or it doesn't have it doesn't have trauma that's going on. I mean, in other words, when you have some kind of background uh, traumatic background, it's like a mouse trap where the spring is being pressed down and pressed down and pressed down, and you're suppressing it and suppressing it and suppressing it. Something can come along and just and just uh, trigger that mouse trap, and it can spring, and you can have a psychotic break. Wow! And that can be a drug that can do that. That can be an experience that can do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically. Yeah, basically drugs and, or various experiences can trigger psychotic breaks. But it's not going to happen. Like you're not going to have a psychotic break if you smoke marijuana. But I some, certainly but, has felt that way sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but, it, um, yeah. But yeah. what about same thing with um? So we also have like a psilocybin cannabin. Uh, psilocybin. 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 I don't know. That's the serotonin system, and that's another fascinating system. I don't know if there's a. There may be, but I don't think that there's a psilocybin receptor. So okay. all, the other, all the other drugs work with fundamental neurotransmitters, specifically dopamine and serotonin. Okay. There's, a, there's, there's, well, there's hundreds of neurotransmitters, but there's a few main ones. Right. Most of the psychotropic drugs like LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, um, DMT, these tend to work with the serotonin system. Okay. Some, a little bit the norepinephrine system, but cannabinoids are special because they work with their own system. Yeah. There's no, there's no LSD system. There's no mescaline system, but there's a cannabinoid system. 
That's yes, amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I know this isn't a chocolate. There's a chocolate system too. <laughs> there's a chocolate system? No, but chocolate has compounds in it that affect that affect other systems. Phenylethanolamine. There's no chocolate system, no. Oh, okay. It's not, <laughs> not one of the fundamental hormone systems. But it does have chem molecules in it that act like epinephrine or a nor a adrenaline or epinephrine or dopamine uh -huh. or oxytocin. Okay. Know? There's a compound in chocolate called PEA. Phenylethanolamine, I think is, is what it is. PEA, phenylethanolamine. And that interacts with certain neurotransmitters in the brain that makes you feel love. And oh. That's why chocolate is associated with love. That's and why we love chocolate. And that's why we love chocolate. Yeah. So, okay, what about um, uh, the gut and cannabinoids? And cannabinoids. There is definitely a cannabinoid system in the gut. And that's one of the main places where it works. In fact, um, you can actually induce nausea with cannabinoids, or you can actually soothe digestive issues, Crohn's disease, and that's one of the main places where cannabinoids are being used medically is for uh, intestinal disorders because it has a calming effect, an anti-spasmodic effect. Colon issues are due to spasming that's in response to either the wrong foods or, or food chemicals. Uh, and uh, uh, the cannabinoids have an anti-spasmodic effect, a calming effect on spasm, a muscle relaxing effect. Okay. So that's one of the main places where they work is on the cannab uh, where the cannabinoids work is on the intestinal system. On the okay. digestive. And then I'm um, moving up into the skin. So is it topically they're being explored for the same idea, relaxing, anti-inflammatory, anti-psoriatic, anti-acne. They have a calming effect on sebum, on oil, on skin oils, mm -hmm. on cell division. Anywhere where the body is operating in a hyper sense, where the breaks have come off of cell division or secretions or muscle movements, so the, the cannabinoids have a relaxing effect. They call like somebody has been diagnosed with like a, um, some kind of like skin sarcoma or, or skin. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, skin now, cancer. now they're being explored that way and there's some logic to it, but there's so many things that cause a cell to become cancerous. You want, you were mentioning skin cancer. Mm -hmm. you know, here's the thing with skin cancer that we don't really understand because we have this kind of misunderstanding about the skin. We don't really see the skin for what it is. There's no such thing as skin cancer. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as breast cancer. There's no such thing as bone cancer. There's no such thing as liver cancer. Is this part of that, um, what did you call it? The uh, everything is true and nothing is true? No, 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 no. Listen, let's check this out. Okay. The reason, and I'm saying this for a reason. I'm, I'm kind of getting your attention when I say this, but I'm really doing this purposefully, okay? The reason we don't know how to address skin cancer is because we have a misunderstanding of what it is. You see, there's no skin cancer, but there's skin cell cancer. There's no breast cancer, but there's breast cell cancer. There's no colon cancer, but there's colon cell cancer. There's no bone cancer, there's bone cell cancer, there's no liver cancer, there's no liver cell cancer, there's no gallbladder cancer, et cetera. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a cellular phenomena. It is not an organ phenomena. This is why we don't know how to treat it, because we're treating the organ or the tissue. We're not treating the cell. Mm. The reason people have skin cancer is because the cell has been disturbed. Cancer is caused, everybody says, oh, we don't know what causes cancer. We're gonna spend, oh, have a war on cancer, a vaccine on cancer, we're gonna cure cancer. No, you don't need to cure cancer. You just need to understand what the heck it is. It's a cell that is freaked out. It's a cell that is under duress and doesn't know what else to do. It's a cell that has been starved it has been suffocated, it has been toxified for so long, it is now reverting backwards in its evolutionary past to a way of being that, that uh, allows it to exist, but not to become a tissue or an organ. A, cell, a cancer cell doesn't become a breast, it's rogue. In order for a cell to become a breast, or to turn into a breast, or a gallbladder, or a bone, it has to give up its own life so it can cooperate with the rest of the cells to form an organ. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So a cell is like an individual being that has sacrificed its Christian. It's mm -hmm. died so that the breasts can have life, so the bones can have life. So that, are you okay here? That's, that's <laughs> okay. deep, Ben. Ben, okay. that was just deep. This, you just blew my mind. This is what's happening. You a made cell, my vein pop out. <laughs> okay. If you take a cell, good, I want to do that. That's a good thing. If, a, if you take a cell out of, your, out of your gum and put it in a Petri dish, it's an independent animal. It's an independent organism. It will go to food. It will run away from toxicity. It will divide, It will live its life like it's an independent being. But when it comes into the body somehow, it sacrifices its independence so it can become an organ or a tissue. But it does that. It expects some cooperation from us. It expects to be fed. It expects to be 
uh, uh, oxygenated, and it expects a clean place to do its work so it can become a bone or a liver or a breast or a skin or an eye or whatever the heck it's going to be. But when it's been, been abused, suffocated, starved, toxified for so long, it's like, screw you. I'm not <laughs> going to become, I'm not going to give up myself. I'm just going to go ahead and divide on my own. And a cancer cell is a cell that doesn't form organs. It doesn't form tissues. It doesn't do its business like an like a, a ordinary cell. Right. It works like a bacteria. A bacteria doesn't form an organ. Bacteria, when they divide, they form more bacteria, but they don't form organs. They don't form tissues. They just stay the same, and they just produce lots of bacteria. That's what a cancer cell is. A bacterial cell is a primitive cell. It's a great advance for a bacterial cell to become an animal cell. Bacterial cell is called a prokaryote. Pro means early. A human, an animal cell is called a eukaryote. A eukaryote is the EU means good. A prokaryote, uh, billions of years ago, prokaryotes turned into eukaryotes. And that's a whole complex story. It's a great story. But the fact is, is that it's a major advance for a prokaryote to become a eukaryote because now all of a sudden you can have organs and you can have systems and you can have different tissues. And this is a very advanced form. But when cancer, when a cell that is eukaryotic has become, has been abused with no food, it's starving, no oxygen, it's suffocating, it's swimming in an ocean of poison, it goes backwards. It, it doesn't have the energy to be a prokaryote now it be, or to be a eukaryote. Now it just becomes a prokaryote, a bacteria, and it just divides. That's its only thing it knows how to do is just divide. It doesn't produce organelles, substructures. It just, it, it doesn't have, take on different shapes. It just keeps dividing. And that's what the cancer cell. So well, the reason I bring this up when you say skin cancer is because the only kind of can skin cancer you get is basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. You get basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinomas. You don't get skin cancer. You get basal cell cancer. You get skin cell cancer. You get squamous cell cancers. Remember, the skin is in layers, right? The top is the stratum corneum, and then underneath you have multiple layers. You don't get into living cells until you get to the lower levels, the squamous cell and, and squamous layer and the basal layer. At the top, there's no cancer because the cells aren't alive. So in order for a, a, a basal cell or a squamous cell to get cancer, to become cancerous, it has to be massively abused. And it's not the sun that's doing it. Mm. it so the reason I bring it up is because we think the skin, because it's on the outside of the body, we think skin cancer is the result of external causes. It's not. It's a result of eating crappy food. It's the result of uh, not having enough nutrients. It's a result of suffocation. It's a result of uh, toxification with drugs and environmental poisons. And then because it's on the outside, the sun can help, can add a burden or can add a stress to it. But it's not like if the sun is the, or, or external factors are the cause. Skin cancer is just like any other cancer. It's a cellular phenomena that is the end result of toxification, suffocation, and starvation long term. It takes a long time. Babies don't get skin cancer. Babies rarely get cancers. The only kind of cancer they sometimes get is cancers of the immune system. And that usually has to do with the same thing. The immune system is overwhelmed. They, mm -hmm. they don't get, it's very rare that, they, that, that kids will get cancers. And so a, a cancer that'll show up on the nose or on, on a breast or in the uterus or on the testicles, what, what, like, what drives where it shows up? Weakness in that specific area some kind of fragility in that area. Right. So, so if it happens in the skin, there, the skin happens, skin cancer is the most common kind of cancer because there's so many external abuses that can happen to the skin. Inside the body, you don't have that, you don't have to worry about that as much. So skin cancer is more common because there are external abuses, but it's not caused by the external abuses. It's caused by starvation, suffocation, and toxification. And that's why to treat skin cancer, you wanna learn, you wanna see it as a cellular phenomena that is in, in effect, the same as any other kind of cancer, which means you got to eat right, you got to make sure you're supplementing, you got to make sure you're keeping the system clean, and you got to make sure you're breathing or, or moving to get oxygen to all the cells. Now, again, I, I always hesitate to just focus on physical stuff because, like I said, there's a spiritual component to cancer. Mm. You know, when we when we spiritually feel disconnected, to me, spirituality is about being connected. Spirituality is about being, we talk about being whole, about being healthy. We talk about being whole inside the body, but there's a holism that occurs with everybody. You want to feel connected to the universe. You know, if you go around in life feeling disconnected, feeling marooned, your, your, your immune system is going to become suppressed. Your, uh, your cortisol is going to go up. Your sympathetic nervous system is going to be increased. You're going to be at higher risk for disease states because you're in fear. 
Mm. You know, there's only two, in the nervous system, there's only really two ways that it can go. It can either go sympathetic or it can go parasympathetic. Sympathetic meaning a relaxing, cannabinoid-like, you know, uh, connected. Parasympathetic. The parasympathetic system. Parasympathetic, parasympathetic system is your safety system. The world is safe. It's okay. Your sympathetic nervous system is your scary system. You're in fear. You know, in Christianity, they talk about being saved, right? That's a misunderstanding. You have to be safe, not saved. You have to be safe. You have to feel connected. You have to feel one with the universe. You have to feel connected to God and spirituality because then you have to have an active sense of spirituality because then your parasympathetic is up. Your blood pressure goes down. Your immune system is strong. Your digestive system is working. You feel happy and awesome and in love. When you're not safe, i.e. not saved, you're in fear. Fear is the illusion. Fear is false evidence appearing real. It's the lie. Satan is the father of lies. Satan is the sympathetic nervous system. And I'm not saying you want to be always parasympathetic because you need a little sympathetic nervous system activity to get you up in the morning, mm. to get you going. But you want to be as, as much parasympathetic as you can with a little spark of sympathetic nerve. The sympathetic nervous system kind of perks you up, but you want to stay parasympathetic in love and in safety and in connection as much as possible. And this is not physical. This is spiritual and even mental and emotional. And then we come into physical. And I always feel uncomfortable and I always, you know, because I do nutrition, I do skid. People always want me to talk about this, the physical side, but I'm always like, you know, SMEP, spiritual, mental, and emotional. You have to be connected spiritually, connected to the God and connected to man. Look at the cross. The cross goes like this and like this, right? Connected to God and connected to each other. And when you <laughs> die on the cross, when you die on the cross, your ego dies and you're connected to God and you're connected to each other. And that's Christianity. Ben Fuchs taking us to church today, folks. All right, praise God. <laughs> so listen to this. So you just made this beautiful correlation, too, about the abhorrent uh, cell that's um, living in this pool of toxicity, and it's suffocated, and it's all this, and it can't be abreast anymore, and so it just gets freaked out, and it no longer can be one. And that's exactly what you just said about us. It's like we need to be uh, yes. in union with each other. Yes, and there's God, a well, We become abhorrent, and we Absolutely. become kind of cancerous ourselves. Absolutely. Sociopathy is cancer. Wow. A cancer cell is a sociopathic cell, and a sociopathic person is a cancerous person. Cancer and sociopathy go hand in hand. There's a really cool book called um, uh, Confessions of a Sociopath. It's written by a lawyer. Uh, go figure, right? And she, <laughs> <laughs> and she says, no, it's terrible. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> and she they're, says- They're uh, used to it. They're used to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have a friend who's a lawyer. We're always telling lawyer jokes. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, so uh, she writes in her book, she says, our culture- skews for sociopathy it rewards sociopathy it rewards people who just use other people who manipulate other people take advantage of other people our corporate leaders our politicians our presidents they're socio sociopaths because the culture rewards people who manipulate other people and so right. we have an epidemic of sociopathy just like we have an epidemic of cancer a cancer is a cell that doesn't care about you it, it, it's just using you for nutrition you know how you die from cancer it takes all your nutrients. Mm -hmm. It takes all your resources because the cancer cells, I don't care about you. I only care about me. You're just a resource for me. That's what a sociopath says. So sociopathy is the macroscopic version of cancer. And we have an epidemic of sociopathy. There's a book called uh, The Sociopath Next Door where this lady says three out of 10 people are sociopaths. 30% of our population is sociopaths. Oh. Exactly. exactly. Can you imagine? I've this certainly known that many, I feel uh, like. Yes. Yeah. The scary thing about a sociopath is a sociopath knows what you need to hear so you'll like them. And they don't care less about you. They just know what you need to hear and they'll just tell you what you need to hear. Wow. It's the scariest thing ever. And that's what cancer is. A cancer cell is a cell that actually masquerades as one of your own cells, but is really secretly dividing on its own and stealing all of your resources and ultimately going to kill you, just like a sociopath. Wow. So yes, in, indeed, what we're talking about is the macroscopic version of what's happening in my yeah, head. As my above, process. so below. As above, so below. Exactly the same. It's all fractals. It's turtles all the way down. You ever hear that story? It's turtles yeah. all the way down. They asked this wise man, what, what is the world sitting on? He said, it's sitting on a turtle. And, and they said, so what's the turtle sitting on? He said, it's sitting on another turtle. He says, so what's that turtle sitting on? He goes, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old side of make that up. So That's cute. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. I was not expecting this conversation today. Right. 
Expect the unexpected. Yeah, thank you. I'm just so, I'm so stoked. Um, okay, so I want to kind of wrap it up and ask you about um, uh, with, um, okay, I'm going into, this is my big complaint since this is my month and it's about me. I feel like I am healthier than I've ever been in many ways. I feel like uh, spiritually, I feel very, very connected and I feel like I'm getting stronger all the time and just feel all these things are wonderful. But my eyesight, and it doesn't, it's like, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll be, I'll, I'll just like pick up my phone and use my phone and realize my glasses aren't on. And then within okay. a couple of hours, I, I can't even see, it doesn't feel like it's, it, it doesn't feel like it's my eyes. It feels like it's something else. They go Is in and out like of work. Near sighted, far, near sighted, far sighted kind of thing? Like you're, sort you're of, losing. Like, like right now, I can't, I'm just, I'm wearing my glasses. They're progressives and um, you're blurry. You're kind of blurry. Those I'm, are muscles. That's a muscle issue. Okay. The eyes focus based on muscular actions. When the muscles start to get weakened through, through long-term inflammation, the muscles are very, very tiny in the eye. So that's one of the first places that muscle weakness will show up. So what I would be doing if I were you is a couple things. First of all, anything you do to build connective tissue, connective tissue building supplements, also help your skin and your bones. Bone bra, things, bra, things all like that. All of that kind of stuff. And then eye exercises. Get a book on eye exercises, vision exercises. There's lots of people who cure nearsighted and farsight, nearsightedness and farsightedness doing eye exercises. Okay. And that will build the musculature in the eyes and allow you to focus better. Eye focusing, whether you're focusing on, on near or focusing on far, requires muscular activity. And when the muscles start to become weakened, that's when you lose near you lose sightedness, either near or far. Okay. And so then um, how do you think electromagnetic frequency plays into damaging those muscles? Doesn't help. You know, we live, you know, we talk about air pollution, we talk about water pollution, we talk about the polluted environment, but there's electromagnetic pollution. And the scary thing about electromagnetic pollution is it didn't exist 100 years ago. So the electro, or 120 years ago, the electromagnetic pollution that we're subjecting ourselves to, this ocean of electromagnetic noise that we're all immersed in, didn't exist a mere 120 years ago. And to it's this degree, been, probably not even 50, 25 years not ago. Not even, correct, exactly. So our bodies haven't adjusted to it. So yes, absolutely. There's no way to there's no way to prevent that. There's a certain baseline amount of toxicity that we are all going to be subjected to just by virtue of being alive on planet Earth in the United States, especially in the year 2020 or 2019. Mm -hmm. It's just it's built in. Yeah. So you can do what you can do, but there's going to be a built-in amount of toxicity that you just can't avoid. And you know, sometimes people tell me. Oh, Ben, you supplement, you take care of yourself, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're going to live to be 100. I say, no, I got to drink the water. I got to breathe the air. I'm living in this electromagnetic. I got to deal with sociopaths. What's that? I got to deal with sociopaths. All of that, all of that, you know? So, I mean, there's a certain, we incarnated here. We are alive in this time period. For whatever reason, there's a certain amount of baseline trauma that we're going to be subjecting ourselves to, and you just can't avoid it. Mm. You know, that's, do you know Rain's glyphosate? which is one of the most toxic substances, Monsanto toxic substances. Yeah, I know a lot about it. Glyphosate. it so you can eat organic all you want, you know, but it's raining glyphosate on your organic foods. It's raining glyphosate in your hair and in your, on your body. So what are you going to do? We, we have decided to, and by the way, I love my iPhone, you know, so I'm, not, I'm on it all the time. I, I'm, super, I'm so much smarter because of my iPhone and the internet and the computer. So I'm responsible for the toxicity too. Yeah, right. You know, we're all in this together. You know, we're all, we're all in the soup together here. We can't be abhorrent cells. We have to like embrace the fact we that- We have to embrace it. Exactly. You know, you can't scream about it because we're all part of it. Oh, Ben, I adore you. Oh, I'm thank so... you so much. And it takes one to know one. So anything you think about me, my mother thinks yes. I'm crazy. You don't think I'm crazy. It's, it's all about- you know, <laughs> Well, I don't know you that way.